The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to AO3. Uh, today, we are going to continue the discussion of waves. Uh, we will discuss a very interesting phenomena today, which is dispersion. And before that, we will uh, discuss a bit, uh, just to give you some reminder about what we have learned so far. So we discovered this uh, wave equation, uh, which is shown here uh, in the class. And we also show you that it describes three different kinds of systems, uh, uh, which we included in uh, the lecture, the massive strings, which uh, the string uh, can uh, actually uh, oscillate up and down in the y direction. And also we discussed about uh, sound waves, right? Uh, this is also discussed uh, in, in a previous lecture. And uh, sound waves can be described by wave equation. And finally, last time, we discussed uh, electromagnetic waves. It's a special kind of waves involving two oscillating fields. One is actually the electric field, the other one is magnetic field, right? So that's kind of interesting because this is actually slightly different from what we discussed before in the uh, previous two cases. This is actually a three-dimensional uh, wave and also involving two different components. And we also discussed the, the solution, the traveling wave solution of the electromagnetic waves. As you, show, you, you can see from here, Electric field is showing us the red, and the magnetic field is showing us the blue. And you can see that in case of traveling wave, they are in phase, and uh, the magnitude reach maxima simultaneously for electric, uh, electric field and the magnetic field. And while in the case of standing wave, there's a phase difference, right? So they don't reach maxima simultaneously in, in the standing electromagnetic field case. Okay. So what are we going to discuss today? We would like to discuss the strategy to send information uh, using waves. Okay, how do we actually send information uh, using waves? So you can say, okay, you just do, maybe I can just send the harmonic uh, oscillation, right? So if I do this, harmonic oscillation, and I can actually put, produce harmonic waves. Right, they are uh, moving up and down, and uh, it's actually uh, with a constant uh, uh, angular uh, momentum and uh, angular uh, uh, frequency, and uh, maybe that's a way to send the information. But but this kind of uh, wave is not in, in reality not super helpful because if you fill the whole space with harmonic waves, then you don't know when did you actually send the signal. Right? Because it's always oscillating up and down, so you don't know the starting time of this signal. Right? So, so in, in reality, this kind of simple harmonic oscillating traveling wave is not super helpful. So what is actually helpful? That's the question. So what is actually helpful is to produce square pulse, for example. Right? We can create square pulse. For example, in this, uh, in this case, I can create a square pulse here. And uh, in the next uh, time interval, I don't create a square pulse. In the next time interval, I don't do anything. And I create another square pulse here, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? If you use this kind of strategy, what we can do is to uh, have uh, some kind of receiver here to actually measure the magnitude of the the, uh, the, the uh, uh, magnitude of the pulse, okay, and then we can actually interpret this data. So, so this all this this wave is going to where the positive uh, x direction or going to the right hand side of the board, and the receiver will be able to interpret this data by placing a threshold on the energy or on the measure the amplitude. Then I can I can say, oh, now I receive a zero. And the next uh, signal I'm receiving is one, and this one is zero, and zero, and one, and zero. In this way, I can actually send information, and this information can be varying as a function of time. Okay? So in short, what would be useful is probably 
to use a narrow square pulse, and that will be very helpful in transmitting uh, information. Okay, so uh, if we consider an ideal string case, okay, if I have an ideal string, as we learned before, uh, uh, the, the, the behavior of this string is described by uh, uh, the wave equation, right? Partial square psi, partial t square, and this is equal to v square, partial square psi, partial t square. Okay, and the, this v is actually related to the the, pro, uh, the speed of the pro progressing wave, right? As we discussed before, the progressing wave solution. Okay, and the, in if if I have this uh, idealized uh, string and it obey the wave equation, the simple version of wave equation, then I will be able to derive the dispersion relation, right? So I can now write down my harmonic as progressing wave in the form of sine kx minus omega t. If I have a harmonic oscillating wave propagating toward the positive uh, x direction at speed of v. Okay, I can write it down in this uh, functional form, where k, as a reminder, is the wave number, and the omega is actually describing how, uh, it's actually the uh, uh, angular frequency, and therefore, uh, if I plug in this solution, and then of course it can have arbitrary amplitude, if I plug in this solution to this equation, then what I'm going to get is, as we uh, did uh, in the last few lectures, there will be a fixed relation between k, which is the wave uh, number, and the omega, the angular frequency. So the fixed relation is actually uh, omega over k will be equal to v, which is actually the velocity uh, in this uh, wave equation. And uh, from the previous discussion, we know this is actually uh, equal to a square root of t over rho l, where t is actually the tension the constant tension uh, which we apply on this string, and the rho L is actually the uh, mass per unit length, as a reminder, okay? So what does this mean? What does this equation mean? We call it dispersion relation at that time, right? But we, we actually didn't explain why do I do that, right? So we are going to learn why this is actually called dispersion relation, omega as a function of k, and uh, in this case, in this very simplified, idealized case, omega over k, this ratio, okay, we know this is related to the propagation of, the speed of the propagation of the harmonic wave, okay, is equal to v. v is a constant, right? It's independent of k. This ratio is independent of k. What does that mean? That means, if I prepare waves, okay, with different wave number, or in the other words, waves with different wavelengths, they are going to propagate at the same speed, right? So the speed of the uh, harmonic uh, uh, progressing wave is, uh, is independent of the wavelength, okay? That's actually very good, because in this case, if I prepare this square pulse, okay, as we learned before, this square pulse is actually uh, a very complicated object, right? Square pulse is really very complicated. You can do a Fourier decomposition, right, as we did before, and we need infinite number of turns of harmonic oscillating waves. We, we actually add them together, so that I can produce a square pulse, okay? And as I mentioned here, if the dispersion relation is omega over k is a constant, is a constant v, that means all the whatever uh, 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 wavelength pulse, which actually added together and produce this square pulse, are going to be traveling at the same speed, therefore, uh, if I have this square pulse in the beginning, after some time t, what I'm going to get is that, okay, this is the original position of the square pulse, and the, 
after some time t, these square piles will move by v times t in the horizontal direction, and the shape of the piles is not going to be changed, okay? Because oh, no matter what kind of wavelengths which produce these square piles, all the com components in these square piles are propagating at the same uh, speed, v, okay? So this kind of system, this kind of uh, system which actually sa satisfy uh, this kind of uh, this uh, uh, dispersion relation is called non-dispersive media, right? No dispersion was happening uh, in, this, uh, in this case, in this highly idealized case, okay? We also know that in case of the string, we are actually making it uh, too idealized, right? So if we consider a more realistic string, then I have to consider an important uh, uh, phenomena, which is the, or say, important property of the string, for example, stiffness, right? What do I mean by stiffness? So for example, if I, can, if I take a string uh, from the piano, a piano string, okay, even if I don't apply any tension to the string, okay, if I bend this string, it doesn't like it, right? It's going to bounce back and uh, restore to its original shape, right? So that's actually what I call stiffness. It's a different contribution uh, compared to the string tension, right? So what I, we have been discussing so far, that this restoring force is actually coming from the string tension T, okay? What will happen if I introduce additional uh, contribution from the stiffness, okay? This stiffness uh, is actually not re completely related to the string tension, and he also wants to restore the shape of the string, okay? Before we go to the modeling, I would like to take some vote to predict what is going to happen. How many of you will predict that if I introduce, I include the stiffness of the string, okay, into my equation, will the speed of propagation increase? How many of you think what is going to happen? One, two, three, Four, five, okay. So, so some of you predict the speed of propagation will increase. How many of you predict that the speed of propagation of the harmonic wave will stay the same? How many of you? One? Okay, only one. Okay, how many of you actually predict that the speed of propagation will decrease? Okay, so all the other uh, students don't have opinion. Okay, want to wait for the answer. <laughs> all right, so you can see that it is actually not completely obvious before we solve this question. And uh, we are going to solve it uh, with a simple model, uh, which actually uh, slightly modify the, uh, the idealized case, well, the idealized wave equation, okay? So now, one semi-realistic model, which I can introduce, to, is to add a turn, additional turn to the wave equation. So I can now rewrite my wave equation to include this effect, this effect to de describe a realistic string, and now this is actually partial square psi, partial t square, this will be equal to v square, partial square psi, partial t square. And uh, the additional term which I uh, put into this gain is minus alpha partial to the four psi, partial x to the four. And this is actually the contribution which, uh, 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 from the stiffness. The stiffness. Okay? So you can see that the, the a wave equation is now modified. And the, what I could do in order to get the relation between omega and the k, what I could do 
is that I can now start with this uh, harmonic wave solution, uh, propagating wave solution, plug that into this equation, this modified equation, and see what will happen. Okay, if I plug this equation into that modified wave equation, what I am going to get is the following. So basically, the left hand side you are going to get omega squared, okay, M minus omega squared. And the, the right hand side you get v squared um, minus uh, k squared and uh, uh, plus alpha uh, k to the four uh, in the right hand side. Okay, so of course I can now cancel this uh, minus sign. This will become plus and this will become minus. And you can see that the relation between omega and the k is now different. Okay, after I introduce this term, which is proportional to alpha. Alpha is actually describing how uh, stiff this uh, uh, string is, okay? Of course, now I can calculate omega over k, which is actually, as we actually learned before, right, is the speed of the propagation of a harmonic, acid, uh, a harmonic wave, okay? So basically, if I calculate omega over k from this equation, then basically what you get is v squared root of 1 plus alpha k squared. OK? So if you look at this equation, OK, the first reaction is, oh, now this omega and the k ratio is not a constant anymore as a function of k. What does that mean? That means if I prepare progressing waves with different wavelengths for wave number k, okay, it's going to be propagating at different speed. Okay? Before we introduce this in, into, the, our, uh, in, into the model, the ratio omega and k is a constant v, independent of k. Now, once you introduce this model into the e equation and you plug in the uh, progressing wave solution uh, to actually check the dispersion relation obtained from this equation, you find that the progressing wave, uh, the speed of progressing wave depends on how distorted this progressing wave is, okay? So let me compare these two situations uh, in this graph, omega versus k, okay? So we will see this dispersion relation graph uh, pretty often in the, in the class today. The y-axis is actually the omega, the angular frequency, and the k is the uh, wave number, two pi over lambda, okay? In the original case, in the case, I have this idealized string, obey the wave equation, which I we introduced in the previous lectures. If I plot omega as a function of k, what I am getting is a straight line. Okay? Question. Ah, uh, this one, right? Oh, maybe I, I made some mistake here. So you should be, uh, you should be also plus here, right? One, two, no. So you have this uh, omega, okay, so this is uh, omega square. And uh, yes, you should have this minus sign here, right? So, so this should be minus. Right, and this should be, okay, or let's go back to the original equation, okay? So basically, you get, uh, so if I plug in this equation to this equation, right? So basically, I get minus omega squared out of it, and I get minus k squared out of this, right? And I, I'm going to get uh, plus k to the four out of this partial square, uh, to the four psi partial x to the four, right? Okay, therefore this should be minus. Okay, maybe I made a mistake. Thank, thank you very much for, for spotting that. Uh, 
Oh yeah, I'm sorry. And now my, my my best day today. Yeah. What did what did I do it? Okay. I must be drunk today. Thank you very much. Uh, any more mistake? Okay. Fortunately not, right? Okay. Very good. So 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 uh, let me uh, do this again. So now I can modify my wave equation, right? Originally, the wave equation is partial square psi partial t square equal to v square partial square psi partial x square. And uh, now I add additional term, which is actually proportional to the uh, uh, partial, square, uh, partial to the four psi partial x to the four. Okay, if I add this term into the gain, and now I plug in the wave equation, uh, the, the, the progressing wave uh, uh, solution into this equ equation, then I will get this formula, okay? So now everything uh, should be correct. And uh, I have clear evidence that everybody is following. So that is very good. And uh, now I can now cancel all the minus sign, right? And then this become plus. And now I can actually calculate what will be the, the uh, speed of uh, uh, propagation for this uh, specific uh, harmonic progressing wave, and the uh, omega over k will be equal to v squared root of one plus alpha k squared, okay? Uh, thank you very much for the contribution. And then now we see that clearly this ratio depends on k, right? So if I plot this on top of the uh, previous curve, which is actually obtained from, from here, okay? Then what I'm going to get is something like this. In the beginning, it's very close to the non-dispersive case, and uh, it goes up because, uh, of, because of this uh, alpha contribution. Alpha is actually a positive number in my, in my uh, model, and the k is actually uh, the, uh, the weight number, okay? So what is going to happen is that basically, after you include the steepness, the slope of this curve is changing as a function of k, okay? Uh, what do I learn from this exercise is that if I increase k, okay, if I have a very large k, okay, that means I have a very small lambda, right? Because k is actually two pi over lambda, okay? So that means I'm looking at something really, really distorted, like this, okay? Both string tension and the steepness wants to restore, okay? Restore the string back to normal. Therefore, what is happening is that you are going to get additional restoring force, right? Therefore, as we actually uh, calculated here, if alpha is actually positive, then the velocity actually increased with respect to what actually, uh, uh, what we actually get before we, we actually add this into the model, okay? So I think that makes sense, right? Because the, the stiffness also wants to restore uh, the, the distortion, therefore you have larger and larger uh, uh, Restoring force, therefore, the speed of propagation of this uh, harmonic wave will increase, okay? So that's pretty nice. But what does that mean to our project? Okay, our project is to send information from one place to the other place, right? So what we just discussed uh, is that we can actually send a square pulse and uh, let it propagate. Okay, a square pulse can be decomposed into many, many pieces, many, many harmonic waves, okay? Before the square pulse works, because all the waves with different wavelengths are, uh, are, uh, are actually uh, uh, moving at this constant speed, right? Independent of the wavelengths. Now we are in trouble, right? As you can see here, that now the speed, which is omega over k, depends on the wave number or wavelength, 
Therefore, different components which actually are needed to create a square pulse are going to be propagating at different speed. You can say, oh, come on, this is actually mathematics, right? I don't believe you, you know, a square pulse is a square pulse, and that's mathematics, that's math department. But we can actually really see that in the experiment, okay? So that's, take a look at this demonstration. Uh, maybe you didn't notice that before, but we have seen this effect from the previous lectures. Okay, so I can now create a square, uh, not, not really a square pulse, but actually some kind of pulse. Okay, I can create some kind of pulse like this. Okay, and uh, as we learned before, right, when this pulse passes through an open end, it's going to be bounced back, right? So therefore, I can have a limit, okay, I can actually show you this demo in a limited uh, 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 setup, but this pulse is going to be going back and forth, right, because I have open end, okay, as we discussed before, okay? What is going to happen is that since we have a realistic, realistic uh, system, what is going to happen is that this pulse will become wider and wider, right? That's the prediction coming from uh, this equation, right? Different component with different wavelengths is going to be propagating at different speed. Therefore, this pulse is going to become wider, and we can see that, okay? So let me quickly produce a pulse and see what will happen. Okay, it, originally, it's actually really sharp, and you can see that really the width of the pulse become wider and wider, and uh, at some point, it disappear. okay? If I have a very long setup, what you are going to see is that it's going to be propagating uh, toward the same direction, and uh, the width of the pulse is actually going to be increasing as a function of time. Let's take a look at this again. Now, this time, you know, we have a negative pulse. You sort of see very similar thing. And also you can see that there are some strange vibration actually lag behind uh, the, the main uh, pulse, right? So that means different, you know, diff, uh, 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 harmonic waves with different wavelengths really are propag propagating at different speed. And the, for that, to demonstrate this effect, I also prepared some demonstration, which actually, uh, are based on our calculation, okay? So you can say that, okay, now I'm convinced I, I can see a dispersion in the experiment. How do I know this calculation actually match with experimental data, right? How about we really uh, put, uh, run a simulation and see what will happen, okay? So what this, uh, what this example actually do is in the, in the beginning, Okay, it will do integration like crazy, okay, in order to get all the components create, uh, calculated. Then it's going to propagate all those pulse, all those different uh, pulse different, different components through uh, the median, okay? And then there will be two different colors. One is actually blue, which is the original shape. The other one is actually the one with steepness turned up, okay? So now, in the beginning, I can set the alpha value to be 0.02 and see what will happen. And I will pr produce a triangular pulse, okay? You can see that now the program is really working very hard to calculate all the components, okay? From 1 to 199 and equal to 1 to 199. And then now, these uh, individual uh, components are propagating through the median. And you can see that originally the shape is like uh, uh, the blue uh, uh, shape, a uh, triangular shape. And you can see that as a function of time, the pulse become wider and wider, okay? Now, of course, I can in increase the alpha to 0.02 and see what will happen. Uh, uh, from 0.02 to 0.2 and see what will happen. You should expect a much uh, larger dispersion. And you can see that now in the beginning, it's doing the integration. And you can see that this time, because the alpha is actually larger, therefore you see that this effect, is actually, this broadening 
is actually happening earlier, and it become broader and broader. And there are a lot of strange uh, structures, as you, you can see also from the demo, are produced because different components are actually propagating at different speed. OK? So of course, we are NIT. So in this course, we have NIT, NIT uh, waves, right? So let's take a look at the NIT wave and see what will happen. Now you see that they are very sharp edge, which actually require really uh, a lot of effort to reproduce that. And you can see that uh, NIT is kind of distorted. That's a bunch of time. You can kind of still identify the peak, but it's actually now displaced. And uh, in the end of the simulation, you cannot see, even recognize that actually originally uh, NIT signal which you send from uh, your source. Okay, so what I want to say is that uh, this effect, this dispersion effect, is really an enemy, uh, which is actually very dangerous, and that way it actually will prevent us from sending uh, high quality uh, signals. Right? Okay. Any questions about all those demos? Yes. Why do we model the yeah, so, so this is because uh, 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 the steepness is actually, is actually symmetric, right? So if you, if you bend this thing, uh, if you bend the, uh, the, uh, the string, then there are contribution from the positive and negative part, okay? If you have uh, 10 to the, uh, if you have uh, partial to the three, partial to the x to the three component, then it's going to be a symmetric, and it's actually against our physics intuition. And also in, the, in this uh, modeling, you also match with our experimental data uh, pretty well. Okay, very good question. And uh, on the other hand, without considering the stiffness, okay, you can also go back to the infinite number of coupled oscillator case. If you instead uh, take an example, which is actually not super small, uh, uh, displacement approximation. You take the next to next de uh, to leading order turn, then you will see that the partial to the three, partial x to the three turn actually cancel because it's symmetric, so I argued. And uh, you will be able to also obtain this turn when you have slightly larger uh, displacement with respect to the equilibrium position. Okay? So I hope that answers your question. Any other question? Yes. For example, if, when you pass through the median. Yeah. yeah. The molecule actually changes the speed of uh, 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 different uh, wavelengths actually differently, right? Very good question. OK, so very good. Uh, we, we got two questions. And then we can see that if I now turn on the, uh, the alpha and make the alpha value uh, large, then you can see that the information is distorted. Okay, and this involves infinite number of, uh, of, of turns. And uh, in this case, in this new demo, which I show here, I have alpha value equal to 0.2. Therefore, the effect of uh, disperse, uh, dis uh, dispersion is actually much larger than what you showed before. And then you can see that this NIT wave quickly becomes uh, something like a Gaussian-like wave, right? Okay? Okay, so very good. So, uh, so you can say, okay, uh, you are making an example, which I, okay, maybe it's, very, it's a very interesting example, but you involve too many turns. Right? You have infinite number of progressing waves in, uh, in this example, okay? It's very difficult to understand, right? How about we go back to a much simpler example? Okay, what, what we can do is that instead of you know, going through infinite number of uh, harmonic waves, now we just consider two waves and uh, overlap these two waves together and see what will happen, okay? And let's see what we can learn from it. Because the, the, uh, you know, the required number of uh, harmonic waves uh, to describe such a pulse is too complicated. So you can say that, okay, 
Now let's just consider two waves and see what we can learn from this. And this is exactly what I'm going to do now. So from Bolex's lecture, I hope that he covered the bit phenomena. Right? So basically, what is a bit phenomena? Bit phenomena happens when you overlap two uh, waves, two harmonic waves. They have pretty close uh, 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 wavelengths, okay? but not the same. Okay? And now, if you add two waves together, that's actually what you are going to get. You are going to get uh, something which is oscillating really, really fast which is actually called the carrier, okay? And uh, also you can see that the magnitude of the oscillation is actually changing as a function of position, and that we call it envelope, okay? So that is actually the bit phenomena which we learned from previous lectures. So in this example, I am going to add uh, two waves together. So the first wave is described by psi, okay, is denoted by psi one. It's a function of x and t, and it has a function of form a is the amplitude, and the sine k one x minus omega t, omega one t. Okay, this is actually a progressing wave propagating toward the right hand side of the board, the positive direction of the x axis in my coordinate system, and it has a wave number k1 and the uh, angular frequency omega1, okay? And I can also write down my second wave, which I would like to overlap with the first wave, right? So this is actually having exactly the same amplitude, which is a, and uh, it is described by a sine function, and you have uh, 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 wave number k2 x, minus omega 2t, angular frequency omega 2. OK. With these two equations, we can calculate the, the speed of the propagation for the individual waves, right? So the first one, I can calculate the speed of propagation v1 will be equal to omega 1 over k1. Very similarly, you can also calculate the speed of propagation for the second wave which is omega 2 over k2, OK? So now what I'm going to do is to calculate the sum of these two waves. So I have the total, which is psi, is equal to psi 1 plus psi 2, OK? So what I'm going to do is to overlap these uh, two waves and see what will happen. Uh, for that, I need this formula, which is a sine A plus sine B. And this will be equal to 2 times sine A plus B over 2 and sine, uh, it becomes cosine here, cosine A minus B over 2. OK? So if I use that formula, OK, basically what I'm going to get is uh, we have 2 times from that formula. So you have 2A. OK, sine k1 plus k2 over 2x minus omega 1 plus omega 2 over 2t, right? So basically, the first term is a sine function, a sine function, and the, the content is actually a plus b. Therefore, you add these two together, right, divided by 2, then basically, this is actually what? You have 10. OK. The second uh, turn is a cosine turn. You get a cosine here. But now you calculate a minus b, which is this, this term minus that term, divided by 2. Then basically what you get is k1 minus k2 divided by 2 times x minus omega 1 minus omega 2 over 2. OK, so that is actually uh, what will happen if you add these two uh, 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 waves together. OK? Until now, everything is exact. And uh, I would like to add additional conditions or additional assumptions uh, when I discuss this solution. OK? 
So how about, in order to produce the bit phenomena, I need to make the wavelengths very, very similar between uh, the two waves, right? So therefore, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to assume K1 is very close to K2, is roughly K, okay? And I am going to, and because of this, since I have a continuous function, if K1 is really close to K2, that means omega 1 is going to be also very close to omega 2, right? So what I'm going to uh, get is omega 1 is going to be also very similar to omega 2, and I will call it omega, okay? So if I do this, when I have very similar K1 and the K2, what is going to happen? What is going to happen is that K1 minus K2 will be very small, right? So that means uh, this very small K means large wavelengths, right? Therefore, this cosine term will become the envelope, right? Because it's actually a slowly varying uh, amplitude as a function of position because the K is very small. K, slow, K small means lambda large. Therefore, the amplitude is going to be having this modulation, which is actually like an envelope. The, the, the speed of this envelope, uh, the oscillation of this envelope is actually controlled by the K, okay? Let's look at the left-hand side term. K1 plus K2 over two. It's kind of like the calculating the average of the first and second, uh, of the, uh, the wave number of the first and second waves, right? So if you calculate the average, it can be still very large. Therefore, you have small uh, lambda, right, compared to the difference, right? Therefore, you see that that actually contributes to those little structures in, the, in, in this graph, and it's called carrier. Yes? Yeah, so, so, so they can be different, right? Uh, so, yeah, so, so, so you are absolutely right, right? So you can, uh, you can produce uh, some, something like a carrier uh, uh, even when K1 is not equal to K2, right? It's just an average, right? Yeah, you are right. But uh, then, the, the, on the other hand, the difference, K1 and K2, will be also large. Therefore, you, it's not as easy as what we have been doing here to identify who is the carrier and who is the envelope, okay? But so you, you, do, you do get some kind of graph, which is oscillating really fast, but the, the envelope is going to be also oscillating really fast. Then it's harder to, to see all the structure. But you are, you are absolutely right, yes. Very good question. So now I have this setup. I assume that they are very close to each other. So now I can define phase velocity. Finally, we define what is actually the phase velocity. The phase velocity, I call it VP. You can see that before I already have been using phase velocity VP for the previous discussions, right? In the case of non-dispersive median, the phase velocity is just the VP, which is the velocity in the equation, right? And in this case, VP will be equal to omega over K, as we discussed before. That's actually the definition of this phase velocity. Okay, and I can now also define the group velocity. Okay, the group velocity is actually the velocity of the envelope, okay? I can calculate the velocity of the envelope, right? In, in the case of phase velocity, I am calculating the velocity of the carrier, right? Okay, I am taking a ratio of the average, and the actually the average is so close to k and omega, therefore, the phase velocity Vp would be just the speed of the propagation of the, the carrier which is actually omega over k. 
I call it VP. And in case of group velocity, I call it VG. Okay, VG is describing the speed of propagation of the envelope. Therefore, what I'm getting is omega 1 minus omega 2, okay, divided by k1 minus k2. Both of them have a factor of 1 over 2, like which is actually canceled, okay? And when they are really so close to each other, this is actually roughly like d omega dk. Any questions so far? So we have derived two different kinds of speed. One is actually related to the phase velocity, which is, uh, one, is actually, uh, one is actually called the phase velocity. It's related to the speed of the carrier, okay? The other one is group velocity, which is actually related to the, the speed of the envelope, okay? So let me describe you a few uh, interesting, interesting examples and let's see what, can, what we can actually learn from this. In the first example, I am working on a non-dispersive median, okay? If I have a non-dispersive median, okay, then basically what I'm going to get is that omega will be proportional to k. If I plot omega versus k, it's a straight line, okay? Now, if I have omega, I choose the omega of the two, uh, omega one and omega two of the two waves to be roughly equal to omega zero, okay? I can now evaluate the VP. The VP will be uh, the slope, right, of, the, of this point, or the slope of a line connecting the zero to that point, right, which is actually the omega over k, right? So that's actually the definition of the phase velocity. I will get this slope. This is the slope of this, uh, uh, this line is actually called, uh, v, is related to the phase velocity, okay? I can also calculate the slope of a line cut through this point, but, but actually cut through this, uh, this, uh, this curve. And uh, in this case, I'm also going to get a line overlapping with phase velocity. Because in this case, omega over k is a constant, which is v. Therefore, if no matter what you calculate, if you calculate vp as a ratio of omega and k, or you calculate Vg, which is actually the, the slope of the line cutting through that point, is you always get, get actually V, okay? Therefore, what we learn from here is that for a non-dispersive median, Vp will be equal to Vg, okay? That means both of these uh, uh, two curves, uh, both of the curve of uh, envelope, describing the envelope and the describing the carrier is going to be propagating at the same speed. Okay, any questions? So the whole thing w w is going to be moving at the constant speed. For that, I can now show you some example which I prepared. Uh, some simulation which I prepared. Okay, let's see. So what it does is that it really, oh, wait a second, this is maybe zero. Okay, so this is the case when I have a non-dispersive median, okay? If I have a non-dispersive median, what is going to happen is that both the, dis, uh, both the, the carrier which is the speed of the, all those little structure, and the envelope is going to be propagating at the same speed. So you can see that high is like a fixed pattern. It's propagating toward the right-hand side, and the, the relative motion between the fine structure and the envelope 
is actually zero. So basically, you have exactly the same pattern as a function of time. OK? So now, I am going to move from away from the non-dispersive medium. How about we discuss what will happen if we have uh, considered the stiffness of the string and see uh, what we get from there. So if I plot omega as a function of k, OK, and uh, consider alpha to be non-zero is a positive uh, value. So if I have alpha to be a positive value, non-zero, OK? In this case, I'm going to get a curve like this. OK? The slope is actually uh, changing and because it's a curving down, it's a curving up, because uh, if you have k large, then uh, you will see that the, the ratio of omega and k actually increase. OK? So that is actually the kind of curve which we will get if I set the omega of the first and second uh, wave in the, in, of, of interest in this uh, study to be omega 0. Then basically, what you are going to get is that, OK, now I have this point here on the curve. OK? If I calculate the phase velocity, the phase velocity, how do I calculate that? I can now connect 0 and that point by a line, OK? And I can now calculate the slope of this line, and I can get the uh, phase velocity Vp, OK? On the other hand, I can also calculate uh, the slope of a line cutting through tangential to the, the point of interest, OK? And that is going to give me the group velocity, OK? As you can see from here, which slope is actually larger? Anybody know? You can, can, can point it out. Group velocity is larger, right? So in this case, if I turn on alpha greater than 0, what is going to happen is that since the group velocity is larger than the phase velocity, that means if I go back to that picture, OK, the envelope is going to be moving faster than the fine structure inside the envelope. How about we take a five minute break from, from here and we continue the discussion uh, after the break. It's a good time to take a break. OK, uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, so we will continue the discussion of the bit phenomena. So uh, what we have shown you is that uh, based on those curves, Actually, we can actually determine what will be the relative uh, velocity of the uh, of the uh, 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 what what will be the uh, the velocity of the the carrier, which is actually uh, denoted by um, v p, and what will be the velocity of the envelope, which is actually denoted by uh, the group velocity. Okay, um, and the, in the in this case, what I actually plotting here is that, in this case, because alpha is actually greater than 0, therefore, this uh, curve is actually uh, curving up. Therefore, you have larger uh, group velocity compared to uh, uh, the phase velocity. So what you would expect is that the envelope is going to be actually progressing uh, at the speed higher than uh, the speed of uh, the uh, the carrier, OK? On the other hand, if magically, OK, I can construct some kind of median which can be described in, with, in this situation alpha smaller than 0, what is going to happen? So if I plot that, if I plot a situation with alpha smaller than 0, so and now I plot omega as a function of k, What is going to happen is like this. So basically, you have something which is actually curving downward. OK? So if, if I now, again, work on some point of interest here, OK, you can see that the slope of uh, the phase velocity 
is now HD, um, the slope of the, the phase velocity is now HD larger than the slope, uh, which is actually uh, from the line cutting through the, the uh, uh, tangential to the, the curve, which is actually uh, getting you the group velocity. So in the case of alpha smaller than zero, which is some strange um, uh, median which I can create from whatever plasma or some really uh, uh, strange uh, kind, new kind of material uh, of uh, interest. If that happens, then that means your uh, group velocity will be smaller than the, the phase velocity. OK? And uh, if you look at this point here, you can see that this curve actually reach uh, a maximum here. And uh, if you actually are operating at this point, what is going to happen? What is going to happen is that if you calculate the group velocity, what will be the value? It will be zero. What does that mean? That means the envelope will not be moving at all. Okay, but the, the, the carriers are still moving. Okay, so in the, at this point, you are getting, going to get group velocity equal to zero. Okay, and finally, if you actually going to a very large k value in this scenario, alpha smaller than zero, you see that even you can have Phase velocity, Vp, positive, right? Because it's actually a positive slope, and the, the group velocity actually is negative, right? What does that mean? That means you are you are going to see a situation that the carriers are progressing in the positive direction, and the, uh, the, the envelope is going to be uh, progressing in the uh, negative uh, direction, progressing to the uh, left-hand side of the board. So what does that mean? That means this wave is doing what Michael Jackson is doing, right? It's actually doing with moon, <laughs> right? So this is actually the kind of thing which could happen, that it looks like that you are, you are doing, you are going forward, because all the uh, carriers are moving in the positive direction, but the body is actually going toward the negative direction, okay? Maybe I can also learn moon work at some point, okay? So let's go back to the uh, demonstration which I got started and somehow I got messed up. Um, so let's take a look at the, the demo again. So let's look at all the different uh, uh, situations at once. So in this case, uh, as we discussed before, this is actually happening in the non-dispersive situation. Right? In this situation, you have a straight line, non-dispersive median actually give you always the group velocity equal to uh, phase velocity, okay? So that means uh, the carrier and the, uh, the envelope is going to be moving in the same uh, direction at the same uh, uh, speed, okay? On the other hand, in this case, we can actually have a situation that the, the phase velocity is actually faster than the group velocity, okay? So what I mean is actually the situation here, the phase velocity calculated from a, a line connecting from zero to that point, okay, is actually having a larger slope compared to the, the tangential line, and you, you will see this uh, situation. So basically you see that inside the envelope, all those carriers are actually moving faster than the envelope. Now, I can have a dispersive median where the group velocity is equal to zero. 
So what is going to happen is that really the envelope is actually not moving. It's not like, like this, right? But the, the body is not moving, right? So you, you have some carriers inside this, uh, in, this, uh, in this structure is actually moving forward, but the envelope is actually not moving. Okay, so finally the last situation is really interesting. So that mean, in this situation, this is actually uh, having the group velocity uh, equal. To, uh, the group velocity is actually having different sign compared to the phase velocity. So you can see that the the whole structure of the envelope is actually moving backward, but the the carrier is actually moving in the, the positive direction in this example. OK, so this is actually what we have learned uh, from, the, uh, from this uh, bit phenomena. And we have covered the, uh, the idea of phase velocity and the group velocity. So how about bound system? How do we understand uh, when we have a bound system, and how does that evolve, evolve as a function of time? So if I have a system of two walls and the one string, and of course I give you the density per the unit length, and the ten string tension, and also the alpha, which is actually telling you uh, about the steepness of this system, OK? Again, I can write down psi xt to be a sum of all the normal mole from 1 to infinity, Km sine Km x plus alpha m sine omega m t plus beta m. And then what we can do is that we can first get the initial conditions uh, of this system, and also the boundary conditions of this system, then we actually just follow exactly the same procedure to obtain all the unknown coefficients. Then we will be able to evolve this system as a function of time, as I have demonstrated to you in the beginning of the lecture. Right? So in this case, you can have two boundary conditions. One is actually at x equal to 0, and the other one is actually at x equal to l. OK, in those boundaries, as we actually learned before, because the endpoints are fixed on the wall, therefore, psi of 0 at the, at, at the time t will be always equal to 0 for the left-hand side uh, boundary condition. And uh, very similarly, as we discussed before, psi of L t will be equal to 0 if you look at the right-hand side of the wall, OK, of the system, OK? So uh, I don't want to repeat this, because this is actually exactly the same calculation which we have done before, right? So with this con these two boundary conditions, we can actually conclude that Km will be equal to m pi over L, and the alpha m will be equal to 0. Okay, so you can actually uh, go back and uh, check this uh, uh, result. So what I want to say is that until now, what we have been doing is identical to what we have been doing for the non-dispersive media. Okay, what I want to say is that the shape of the normal mole is actually set by the boundary condition. Okay, it's determined by the boundary condition, and it has actually so far, nothing to do with the, the dispersion relation omega as a function of k. OK? So, th so in short, boundary condition can give you the shape of the normal modes. And we know that the first normal mode, second normal mode, et cetera, et cetera, is actually uh, uh, going to be identical to the case of non-dispersive media. OK, so that's actually the first thing which we learned. The second thing we learned is that, OK, now 
what we see is that once the boundary condition is given, then the Km is actually also given. Therefore, since I have the dispersion relation omega as a function of k, as shown there, right? Omega is equal to, omega over k is equal to v times square root of 1 plus alpha k squared, right? Therefore, once kn is given, omega m is also given, right? So you can see that that's actually where the dispersion relation comes into play. The omega n will be different if you compare the dispersive case and non-dispersive case, OK? So that is actually uh, what I want to say. The Kn, which is the shape of the normal mole, doesn't depend on the dispersion relation. On the other hand, the speed of the oscillation, the angular frequency omega, depends on the dispersion relation, which is actually what we obtained from there. If I start to plot omega n as a function of kn. So in the case of non-dispersive median, so what I'm going to get is actually discrete points along a straight line. OK, this is actually uh, k1, k2, k3, k4, etc. They are actually, they are actually uh, all sitting on a common straight line. OK? If you do get the, 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 the relative uh, uh, difference between k1, k2, and k3, they are constant, right? According to this, this formula, the difference between k1 and k2 is pi over 2. K2 and K3 is actually also pi over 2, uh, pi over L, OK? It's always uh, a fixed number. And the since omega is actually proportional to K, therefore, the spacing between omega 1, omega 2, omega 3 is also constant, OK? In short, omega 2, omega 3, and omega 4, et cetera, it's always a multiple times of what you get from omega 1, right? According to uh, this uh, graph and the, in the case of non-dispersive median, OK? So what does that mean? That means, OK, now if I have a very complicated initial condition, OK? This is actually what I have in initial condition, very complicated, OK? I just need to wait. If, if this is actually a non-dispersive median, then I just have to wait until t equal to 2 pi over omega 1. Then this system will restore to its original shape. OK, that's actually what I, I can learn from here, right? Because omega 2, omega 3, and any higher uh, uh, order uh, normal modes the angular frequency is actually multiple times of what I get from omega 1, OK? On the other hand, if I consider a situation of dispersive median, OK, you can see that now, now the difference between omega n is not a constant, OK? So what you will predict is that it would take much, much longer for this system to go back to the original shape compared to a, a non-dispersive median. OK, so that actually you can actually see in a, in a real life uh, experiment. I can distort this, uh, 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 this equipment in this bound uh, system. And it's actually going to take forever or impossible to come back to the original shape because of the dispersion. OK? On the other hand, if I have a really highly idealized uh, situation, if I have both ends bound, and I just have to wait until t equal to 2 pi over omega 1, then this system will go back to the original shape. Before I end the lecture today, OK? 
I would like to discuss with you two interesting issues. So many of you have seen water waves, right? And Feynman actually told us in his lecture that water waves are, the, are really easily seen by everybody. But it's actually the worst possible example. That's the bad news. The worst possible example, because it has all the possible complication uh, that waves can have. That's the bad news. The good news is that you are going to do that in your PSET. <laughs> okay. So we will be able to understand the behavior of the water waves. So that's the good news. <laughs> The second thing which I would like to talk about is phase velocity, okay? You can see that this, okay, you can say, okay, you say that phase velocity or harmonic waves doesn't send information, right? And, uh, and uh, how do I actually know that, right? So what does that mean? Okay, so let's take this horrible example of water wave, so, okay? So, so the, the, the black line is actually the, the the beach, and uh, you, there's a water wave uh, from the ocean approaching the beach, and you can see that you can have some kind of angle between the incident water wave and the, the, the line of the beach, okay? Um, what I can actually do is that I can now measure the shape of the, the, the water, uh, uh, water wave at the, at the edge of the, the beach, and I will see that, huh, now the, the phase velocity which I observe there is actually faster than the speed of uh, propagation uh, of the water wave because of this, uh, this ang incident angle, okay? I can actually make it very, very fast. I can make this speed actually even faster than the speed of light, right? I can, I, can, I can now decrease the, the theta to zero. Then you will have, a, you will have a, a phase velocity which is faster than the speed of light. It goes to infinity. But does that mean anything? Actually, that doesn't mean anything. Because that, I don't really move the water from a specific point to another point infinitely fast. Therefore, what I want to say is that, okay, you can do whatever you want to make a fancy phase velocity, but that will not help you with sending things close to the speed of light or greater than the speed of light, okay? So as you can see from this example, I can easily construct a simple example, which you see that it's actually really not sending anything from one place to the other. But you still have a really, really fast velocity. Okay, thank you very much everybody for the attention and I uh, hope you enjoy the lecture and if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. <laughs>